Good evening. It is Friday, April 17th. This is Mrs. Bloom reading Artemis, followed by Owen Colfer. If you will remember, they have reached sort of a, an ending point. The gold is coming into the home. The troll is gone. And now we have Artemis' final plan. We're at the second part of Chapter 9. Automatic compensator, my foot, started Root. Yeah, 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 replied Foley. I'm working on it. It's a ransom, shouted Butler. Artemis tried to quell the excitement rising in his chest. This was not the time to allow emotions to enter the equation. Check for booby traps. Butler stepped cautiously onto the porch. Shards of disintegrated gargoyle lay scattered beneath his feet. No hostiles seemed to be self-propelled. The trolley lurched over the steps. I don't know who's driving this thing, but he could do with a few lessons. Butler bent low to the ground, scanning the trolley's underside. No explosive devices visible. He extracted a sweeper from his pocket, extending the telescope aerial. No bugs either. Nothing detectable at any rate. But what do we have here? Uh-oh, said Foley. It's a camera. Butler reached in, pulling the fisheye lens out by the cable. Nighty night, gentlemen. In spite of the load it carried, the trolley responded easily to Butler's touch, gliding across the threshold into the lobby. It stood there, humming softly, as though waiting to be unloaded. Now that the moment had come, Artemis was almost afraid to seize it. It was hard to believe that after all these months, his wicked scheme was minutes away from fruition. Of course, these last few minutes were vital ones, and the most dangerous. Open it, he said at last, surprised at the tremble in his own voice. It was an irresistible instant. Juliet approached tentatively, spangled eyes wide. Even Holly closed the throttle and notch, dropping until her feet brushed the marble tiling. Butler unzipped the black tarpaulin, dragging it across the cargo. Nobody said a thing. Artemis imagined that somewhere the 1812 overture was playing. The gold stat there, sat there, stacked in shining rows. It seemed to have an aura, a warmth, but also inherent danger. There was a lot of people willing to die or kill for the unimaginable wealth this gold would bring. Holly was mesmerized. Fairies have an affinity for minerals. They are of the earth, but gold, that was their favorite. Its luster, its allure... They paid it, she breathed. I can't believe it. Neither can I, murmured Martimese. Butler, is it real? Butler hefted a bar from the stack. He dug the tip of a throwing knife into the ingot, gouging out a small sliver. It's real, all right, he said, holding the scraping up to the light. This one, any rate. Good, very good. Begin unloading it, would you? We'll send the trolley back out with Captain Short. Hearing her name dispelled out Holly's gold fever. Artemis, give it up. No human has ever succeeded in keeping fairy gold, and they've been trying for centuries. The Lep will do anything to protect their property. Artemis shook his head, amused. I've told you. Holly shook him by the shoulders. You cannot escape. Don't you understand? The boy returned her gaze coolly. I can escape, Holly. Look in my eyes and tell me that I can't. So she did. Captain Holly Short gazed into her captor's black, blue eyes, and she saw the truth in there, and for a moment she believed it. There's still time, she said desperately. There must be something. I have magic. A crease of annoyance wrinkled the boy's brow. I hate to disappoint you, Captain, but there is absolutely nothing. Artemis paused, his gaze tugged momentarily upstairs to the converted loft. Perhaps, he thought, do I really need all this gold? And was his conscience not needling him, leeching some of the sweetness from his victory? He shook himself. Stick with the plan, stick with the plan, no emotion. Artemis felt a familiar hand on his shoulder. Everything all right? Yes, Butler. Keep unloading. Get Julia to help. I need to talk to Captain Short. Are you sure there's nothing wrong? Artemis smiled. No, old friend. I'm not sure, but it's too late now. Butler nodded, returning to his task. Juliet toddled along like a terrier. Now, Captain, about your magic. What about it? Holly's eyes were hooded with suspicion. What would I have to do to buy a wish? Holly glanced at the trolley. Well, it depends. What do you have to bargain with? Root was not what you call relaxed. Increasingly wide bands of yellow light were poking through the blue. Min minutes, minutes. His migraine had not helped by the pungent cigar feeding toxins into his system. Of all the non-essential personnel being evacuated? Well, unless they've sneaked back in until the last time you asked. Not now, Foley. Believe me, now is not the time. Anything from Captain Short? Nope. We lost video after the troll thing. I guess the battery ruptured. We'd better get that helmet off for ASAP or the radiation will fry her brain. That'd be a pity after all this work. Foley returned to his console. A red light began pulsing gently. Wait, motion sensor. We've got activity by the main entrance. 
root across the screens. Can you enhance it? No problem. Fully punched in the coordinates, blowing up 400%. Root sat down in the nearest chair. Am I seeing what I think I'm seeing? You sure are, chuckled Foley. This is even better than the suit of armor. Holly was coming out with the gold. Retrieval was on, was on her in half a second. Let's get you out of the danger zone, Captain, urged a sprite, catching Holly by the elbow. Another ran a rad sensor over her helmet. Got a power source breach here, Captain. We need to get your head sprayed immediately. Holly opened her mouth to protest and had it instantly filled with rad suppressant foam. Can't, can't this wait, she sputtered. Sorry, Captain. Time is of the essence. The commander wants a debriefing before we detonate. Holly was rushed toward mobile ops unit, her feet barely touching the ground. All around her, retrieval cleaners scanned the grounds for any trace of the siege. Techies dismantled the field shields, making ready to pull the plug. Grunt steered the trolley toward the portal. It was imperative that everybody re relocated to a safe distance before the biobomb went in. Root was on the steps. Holly, he blurted, I mean, Captain, you made it. Yes, sir, thank you. And the goal, too? That's a real feather in your cap. Well, not all, Commander. About half, I think. Root nodded. No matter. We'll have the rest soon enough. Holly wiped rad foam from her brow. I've been thinking about that, sir. Fowl made a mistake. He never ordered me not to re-enter the house, and seeing as he brought me here in the first place, the invitation still stands. I could go in and mind-wipe the occupants. We could hide the gold in the walls and do another time stop tomorrow night. No, Captain. But, sir... Root's features regained whatever tension they'd lost. No, Captain. The council is not about to hold off for some kidnapping mudmen. It's not going to happen. I have my orders, and believe me, they're written in stone. Holly trailed Root into the mobile. But the girl, sir, she's an innocent. Casualty of war. She threw her lot in with the wrong side. Nothing can be done for her now. Holly was incredulous. A casualty of war? How can you say that? A life is a life. Root spun harshly, grasping her by the shoulders. You did what you could, Holly, he said. No one could have done more. You even retrieved most of the ransom. You're suffering from what humans called Stockholm Syndrome. You've bonded with your captors. Don't worry, it'll pass. But those people in there, they know about us. Nothing can save them now. Foley looked up from his calculations. Not true, technically. A welcome back, by the way. Holly couldn't spare a second to return the greeting. What do you mean it's not true? I'm fine, seeing you asked. Foley! shouted Root and Holly in unison. Well, like the book said, if the mud man gold can gather in spite of magic or fairy glamour, then that gold is his to keep until he lies in eternal sleep. So if he lives, he wins. It's that simple. Not even the council will go against the book. Foley scratched his chin. Should I be worried? Foley laughed mercilessly. No, those guys are as good as dead. As good as isn't good enough. Is that an order? Affirmative, soldier. I am not a soldier, said Foley, and pressed the button. Butler was more than a little surprised. You gave it back? Artemis nodded. Well, about half. We still have quite a nest egg, about fifteen million dollars at today's market prices. Butler wouldn't usually ask, but this time he had to. Why, Artemis? Can you tell me? I suppose so. The boy smiled. I felt we owed the captain something for services rendered. Is that all? Artemis nodded. No need to talk about the wish. It could be perceived as weakness. Hmm, said Butler, smarter than he looked. Now we should celebrate, enthused Artemis, deftly changing the subject. Some champagne, I think. The boy strode to the kitchen before Butler's gaze could dissect him. By the time the others caught up, Artemis had already filled three glasses with Dom Perignon. I'm a miner, I know, but I'm sure Mother wouldn't mind just this once. Butler felt something was afoot. Nevertheless, he took a crystal flute offered him. Juliet looked at her big brother. Is it okay? I suppose so, he took a breath. You know, I love you, don't you, sis? Juliet scowled, something else that the local louts found very endearing. She smacked her brother on the shoulder. You are so emotional for a bodyguard. Butler looked his employer straight in the eye. You want us to drink this, don't you, Artemis? Artemis met his gaze squarely. Yes, Butler, I do. Without another word, Butler drained his glass. Juliet followed suit. The manservant tasted the tranquilizer immediately, and although he would have had ample time to snap Artemis Fowl's neck, he didn't. No need for Juliet to be distressed in her final moments. Artemis watched his friend sink to the floor. A pity to deceive them, but if they had been alerted to the plan, their anxiety could have counteracted the sedative. He gazed at the bubble swirling in his own glass, time for the most audacious step in his scheme. With only the barest hint of hesitation, he swallowed the tranquilizer-laced champagne. 
Artemis waited calmly for the drug to take hold of his system. He didn't have to wait long, since each dose had been calculated according to body weight. As his thoughts began to swirl, it occurred to him that he might never awaken again. It's a bit late for doubts, he chided himself, and sank into unconsciousness. She's away, said Foley, leaning from the council. Out of my hands now. They followed the missile's progress through polarized windows. It really was a remarkable piece of equipment. Because its main weapon was light, the fallout could be focused to an exact radius. The radioactive element used in the core was selenium, too, which had a half-life of 14 seconds. This effectively meant that Foley could tune the biobomb to blue rinse only follow manner and not one blade of grass more, plus the building would be radiation-free in under a minute. In the event that a few sodium flares refused to be focused, they would be contained by the time field. Murder made easy. The fight path is pre-programmed, explained Foley, though no one was paying this blind bit of attention. She'll sail into the lobby and detonate. The casing and firing mechanism are plastic alloy and will completely disintegrate, clean as a whistle. Root and Holly followed the bomb's arc. As predicted, it swooped through the decimated doorway without knocking so much as a sliver of stone from the medieval walls. Holly switched her attention to the missile's nose cam. For a moment, she caught a glimpse of the grand hallway where she'd been, until recently a prisoner. It was empty, not a human in sight. Maybe, she thought, just maybe. Then she looked at Foley and the technology at his fingertips, and she realized that the humans were as good as dead. The biobomb detonated. A blue orb of condensed light crackled and spread, filling every corner of the manor with its deadly rays. Flowers withered, insects shriveled, and fish died in their tanks. Not one cubic millimeter was spared. Artemis Fowl and his cohorts could not have escaped. It was impossible. Holly sighed, turning away from the already dwindling blue rinse. For all his grand designs, Artemis had been a mere mortal in the end, and for some reason she mourned his passing. Root was more pragmatic. All right, suit up, full blackout gear. It's perfectly safe, said Foley. Didn't you ever listen in school? The commander snorted. I trust science about as far as I could throw you, Foley. Radiation has a habit of hanging around when certain scientists have assured us that it's dissipated. No one steps outside the unit without a blackout gear, and that counts you out, Foley, only bipedal suits. Anyway, I want you on monitors, just in case. In case of what? wondered Foley. But he didn't comment. Save it for a I told you so later. Root turned to Holly. Good captain? Going back in, the idea of identifying three cadavers didn't appeal to Holly, but she knew it was her duty. She was the only one with first-hand knowledge of the interior. Yes, sir. On my way. Holly selected a blackout suit from the rack, pulling it over her jumpsuit. As per training, she checked the gauge before tugging the vulcanized cowl. A dip in pressure would indicate a rip, which could prove fatal in the long term. Root lined up an insertion team at the perimeter. The remains of Retrieval 1 were about as eager to insert themselves into the manor as they would be to juggle Atlantean stink balloons. You're certain the big one's gone? Yes, Captain Kalpi's gone, one way or another. Trouble wasn't convinced. Because that's one mean human. I think he had magic of his own. Corporal Grubb giggled and got an immediate clip on the ear for himself. He muttered something about telling Mommy and quickly strapped on his helmet. Root felt his complexion redden. Let's move out. Your mission is to locate and recover the bullion. Watch for booby traps. I don't trust Fowl when he was alive, and I definitely don't trust him now he's dead. The word booby traps got everyone's attention. The idea of a bouncing Betty anti-personnel mine exploding at head height was enough to dispel any nonchalance in the troops. No one built weapons of cruelty like mudmen. As the junior recon officer, Holly was on point, and even though there wasn't supposed to be any hostiles in the manor, she found her gun automatically strained to the Neutrino 2000. The mansion was eerily quiet, and only the fizzle of the last few selenium flares to alleviate the stillness. Death was there, too, in the silence. <coughs> the manor was a cradle of death. Holly could smell it. Behind those medieval walls lay the bodies of a million insects, and under its floors the cooling corpses of spiders and mice. They approached the doorway tentatively. Holly swept the area with an X-ray scanner. Nothing under the flagstones but dirt in the nest of dead money spiders. Clear, she said into a microphone. I'm going in, Foley. You got your ears on? I'm right there with you, darling, replied the centaur, unless you step on a landmine, in which case I'm back in an operations room. Are you getting any thermals? Not after a blue rinse. We have residual heat signatures all over the place, mostly selenium flares. Won't calm down for a couple of days. But no radiation, right? Yeah, that's right. Ruth snorted in disbelief. Over the headsets, it sounded like an elephant sneezing. Looks like we're going to have to sweep the house the old-fashioned way, he grumbled. Make it quick, advised Foley. I give it five minutes tops before a foul manor rejoins the world at large. 
Holly stepped through what used to be the doorway. The chandelier swung gently from the concussive force of the missile detonation, but otherwise everything was as she remembered. The gold's downstairs in my cell. Nobody an answered, not in words. Someone did manage to retch, right into a microphone. Holly spun around. Trouble was doubled over, clutching his stomach. I don't feel so good, he groaned. A tad unnecessarily, considering the pool of vomit all over his boots. Corporal Grubb took a breath, possibly to utter a sentence containing the word mommy. What came out was a jet of concentrated bile. Unfortunately, Grubb didn't have the opportunity to open his visor before the illness struck. It was not pretty. Ugh, said Holly, pressing the corporal's visor release button. A tsunami of regurgitated rations flooded over Grubb's blackout suit. Oh, for heaven's sake, muttered Root, elbowing past the brothers. He didn't get very far. One step over the threshold, and he was throwing up with the rest of them. Holly pointed a helmet cab at the stricken officers. What the heck's going on, Foley? I'm searching. Hold on. Holly could hear computer keys being punched furiously. Okay, sudden vomiting, spatial nausea. Oh, no. What? asked Holly, but she already knew. Maybe she always had. It's the magic blurted Foley, words barely decipherable in his excitement. They can't enter the house until Fowl's dead. It's like an extreme allergic reaction. That means unbelievable. It means... They made it, completed Holly. He's alive. Artemis Fowl is alive. Darn it, groaned Root, and heaved another quart of vomit onto the terracotta tiles. And we will stop there for this evening. I hope you have a good evening. We'll continue tomorrow night.